Hey, uh, good morning, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Prashant Muthukrishnan, Assistant Professor, United Hospital Center. And uh, we are here in Bridgeport, West Virginia. Cool, very timely topic. Uh, ever since we started having COVID in 2021 here locally in UHC, it's a good time to talk about ventilator associated events. So the background behind this topic is about 300,000 to 800,000 hospitalized patients are at risk for mechanical ventilation. Five to 10% of ventilator patients are likely to develop VAE, which is ventilator associated events. Historically, VAP, which is pneumonia, ventilator associated pneumonia, was feared as one of the most lethal healthcare associated infections with a crude mortality of about 35% and 10% approximately of disease specific mortality from the pneumonia itself adds about 10K to $50,000 because of you know, having an extra diagnosis uh, that's changing your course of disease, such as VAP, four to seven ICU days uh, of uh, likelihood of adding to your length of stay and 14 hospital days added because of VAP. So possible complications of mechanical ventilation include VAEs, which is comprising of VAX, IVAX, and VAPs. Other clinical syndromes are also likely to complicate your stay on the mechanical ventilator, ARDS, sepsis, pulmonary embolism, pulmonary edema, barotrauma, and so on. So the background behind this lecture uh, for me to present here at UHC is because in 2020 and 2019, things were slightly different, very different maybe. Uh, there were less number of acute respiratory failure patients with severe ARDS per day or per month. More importantly, in early 2020, because of COVID restrictions, a lot of elective procedures, semi-elective procedures, uh, or you know, procedures uh, also uh, were shut down uh, due to COVID restrictions. So that may have had some influence on the number of ICU uh, post-op patients, post-surgical patients, et cetera. And, uh, and people, you know, stopped coming to the hospital. So, um, so, you know, there is likelihood of you know, contribution from that. Uh, as you see here, most of the VAEs that were reported in the year 2021 happen to be August, September, October, November, December. And very importantly, the reason why I'm presenting this lecture today is because our respiratory therapist in charge and the uh, case management regarding uh, reporting of uh, hospital acquired events, including CLAPSI, CARDI, and so on, uh, they came to us saying, hey, you know, have you noticed uh, that there has been 18 cases of VAE reported in 2021 as against just two or three in 2020. And so, um, you know, since then, uh, we have been uh, going through this educational process. So on this slide, you see, uh, you know, some details like the date of the actual event uh, of VAE being documented, the admission date, uh, hospital day number, and the VAE type, which is VA VAC or IVAX uh, or PRAPs. Uh, seems like we did not have documentation of PRAPs here, uh, which is possible or probable ventilator or pneumonias. Uh, initiation day of ventilator and then what day of ventilator was the VAE documented? And criteria, what kind of criteria was met? Uh, number one increased FiO2 is one possibility, elevated white blood cell count, rosefen or antibiotics with at least four days duration, uh, increased PEEP is also seen as one of those criterions, right? So those are examples. And you see that during the later part of the year, uh, you see um, th there's more COVID cases compared to the earlier part of the year. And each case has an NHSN event number, which is National Health Safety Network, which is the, da it's the database that's uh, keeping track of uh, VAEs, uh, just like CAUDI and CLAPSI. 
like UTIs and uh, central line associated bloodstream infections, etc. So compared to 2020, when we had 483 events per year in that year, uh, 2021 had a little bit more, 539, total number of event days, 1,460, uh, as again is 2,400. And uh, ICU length of stay, three, as again is 4.5. All right, this is an excellent uh, resource for you all, Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality from the government as well as NHSN. So I highly recommend to look into this particular document. Um, the link is provided. So let's give you the basics of how to find a VAE or a VAC. VAC is nothing but ventilator associated condition. Okay? Daily minimum peep value, minimum in the sense the lowest peep value, if that has increased to at least three centimeters of water pressure over the lowest value of your PEEP in the previous two calendar days, that's one possibility, or daily lowest value of FiO2 has increased by at least 20% compared to the preceding two days uh, FiO2 on your documentation. Either of these, if they're met, then you have a VAC. And there's a lot of uh, ifs and buts. So, most important thing to remember is two calendar days, and this is not 48 hours. This is two calendar days, which means on day one of your ventilator stay, even if the patient got intubated at 11.59 p.m., just before midnight, that entire day is counted as calendar day, day one, and then go on to the candidate number two. So once you have a patient who's on mechanical ventilation for greater than two days, okay? That's one of your basic criteria. You cannot call somebody as a VAE if they've just been on the ventilator for about uh, one full calendar day and they're still on their second day of ventilator, they are not yet qualifying to even look at a VAE. So they have to get into the third calendar day. Baseline period of stability of PEEP and FiO2 or improvement followed by a sustained period of worsening oxygenation in the form of PEEP or FiO2 requirement is called as a VAC. And along with that, if you have general evidence of infection or inflammation, then that's called IVAC. On top of that, if you have a positive result of microbiological testing, then it's called possible or probable VAC. We'll help you with our uh, case scenario. Patient undergoes emergency laparotomy for ischemic colon, ends up actually finding cancer in the bowel, comes back from OR on the vent, open abdomen, wound back at 40% FiO2 and five of PEEP. And this is around midnight, okay? So that's already calendar day one. That's when the patient comes through the ER and goes straight into the OR. And then as pulmonary physicians, we see the patient during the morning next day. That's already day two here, right? Seen during rounds, we notice right up below consolidation or a mass, possibly either lung metastasis or pneumonia, is on an empiric antibiotics for both respiratory and GI coverage, 40%, five of PEEP still, right? And he's not on pressors. And we continue antibiotics, we do pulmonary toilet, and we end up keeping him on 40% and five of PEEP. Good. SATs about 90, 95. And, uh, and however, what happens the same evening? pulmonary physician is not around back home because we have an open ICU. The hospitalists are here all night and the RT manages the, uh, the vents and they call us uh, based, uh, based on the, you know, the event. The patient starts needing seven of PEEP and 50% before midnight. And so five to seven and then 5% to 50%, okay? Day three, early morning goes to the OR even before I see him or the pulmonary physician see him, sees him, goes to the OR on 60% FIO2 and 8 of PEEP versus after coming back from the OR on pressors, he's on 100% now and 9 of PEEP. PF ratio less than 100, right? So, and this is, these are some examples of uh, uh, images, uh, both the chest X-ray showing the mass um, and the CT scan, similar showing. And, you know, he had pneumoperitoneum, also pneumomediastine. So what happened? So, 121, January 21, 
uh, this is 2022, right? This is a case, case example from this year. 40% on the night number one or day number one. Uh, <clears throat> and here you see, all I want you to follow with me is, what is the lowest FiO2 for that day? What is the lowest PEEP for that day? 40, 40, 100, okay, boom. You have day one, day two, and day three. You have two days of stability, which means both the days on 21 and 22, your lowest FiO2 was, was unchanged, right? Whereas if your lowest FiO2 on day two was 50%, then boom, you don't qualify for a VA. Similarly, if your PEEP on day one, the lowest PEEP was five, for him, the, the next day also, the lowest PEEP was still five. So therefore, he ends up qualifying um, to even look at whether you know on day three or day four or day five, uh, whether he could be uh, um, valid for looking into a VAE. And there we go. Yes, he increased uh, his FIO2 requirements by more than 20% and more than two of PEEP. So that's a simple example. So five on day one, five on day two, unfortunately eight on day three. So that right there, you have a back. 40%, 40%, 60%. So that, there you have a back. And uh, this is a beautiful calculator um, that's available on that particular website. It helps you um, figure out exactly when your VA is. All right, so tips from this case. Watch out for VAs more so in the evening and nighttime hours because that's where the physician may not be as much available in the RT and the nursing might end up actually cranking up settings. Um, encouraging RT discussions with the attending is very important uh, about VA prevention strategies. Preemptively, it's potentially a good idea to use moderate peeps, six to eight centimeters of water pressure for people who don't meet criteria yet for even you know PF ratio of less than 300, but you have a pulmonary pathology, okay? Um, and it's likely to get worse in the next few days if they go into shock or you have to pump in a lot of fluids, et cetera. Reminders to review PF ratios daily to see whether your PF ratio is dropping. And that might be a good idea to uh, crank up your PEEP in, 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 you know, in small por uh, proportions. You know, five today, go up to six tomorrow. If you want, you can go up to you know, seven the next day. Therefore, there is a trip there. You are making sure you don't have a steady baseline and therefore your patient will never qualify for a VAE. All right. Um, and day one example, five of P, 5.5, day three, six, and so on. Okay, case number two, 59 year old lady with severe scoliosis, super hard, she has the hardware, she's intubated, for COVID respiratory failure with right lower lobe pneumonia, extubated within two days of intubation, but then gets reintubated in three days. For hypercapnia and alter mental status, decreased mental status, so we get a CT brain, uh, concern for ossified lesion, posterior to the dense, resulting in spinal cord compression, CT cervical spine de demonstrated odontoid fracture, right? So she has now a neurosurgical uh, emergency. Um, anterior subluxation of C1 on C2, resulting in severe canal stenosis, super weakness, quadriviruses, right? And despite quadriviruses, uh, despite uh, the going for surgery, C1, C3, deep compressive laminectomy and fusion, she's still left with severe quadriviruses. And you see the chest x-rays are much worse four days prior to VAE compared to the day of VAE. So it's really important to uh, predict what might happen uh, even if somebody is on 40% 40, 40 of PEEP and 40% uh, of FIO2 and 5 of PEEP on day one, day two, try to see if you can you know, prepare for the future for the worst possible scenario. So here again, uh, 60 is the lowest PEEP, uh, lowest FIO2 on the 4th of Jan. 70 is the lowest FIO2 on 5th of Jan. And therefore, you don't have a steady baseline on the FIO2. However, you do have a steady baseline on the PEEP. So six on January 4th, and the lowest PEEP continues to be six on January 5th. And now that is only the reason why this patient ended up qualifying to even look into a VAE. And therefore you, the next day it goes up to 12, 10. And important uh, information right here. If on the 6th of January, okay, 
even though the patient went on to 10 or 12 of PEEP, if the RT had done pulmonary toilet or certain things it was done to uh, see if they can get the PEEP back down to six, then, uh, then that is a good enough uh, option to you know, not qualify for a VA. Okay, so right there. IVAC criterion one and two. Uh, All right, so that was VAC. Um, IVAC is the next uh, category. So the patient already meets criterion for VAC. And now if you have both of the following criteria on or after calendar day three of mechanical ventilation, and it has to be within two calendar days before or after onset of worsening oxygenation. Number one, temperature greater than 38 or less than 36 white blood cell count greater than 12 or less than four. And then criteria number two, at least four days of uh, antibiotics that have been started uh, empirically. So that's IVAC. Okay, let me talk to you about a case example of a VAC and why it is not called a VAC. Number one, here you see that there is no increase of PEEP of three or more uh, from the minimum value. So six, five, five, seven. So there's no increase from five to eight or six to nine and so on, right? Uh, and then, however, uh, on the FIO2, the reason why there is um, no, uh, why they don't meet criteria for a VAC is because number one, if you look at day number four, um, it's 50% and day number five is 70%. Therefore, there is a 20% increase in uh, FiO2. However, the day prior, right, the two days prior, there is no steady baseline. And therefore, you don't qualify to even look at or a back. All right. So after 48 hours of stable or decreasing daily minimum PEEPs or FiO2s, if there is a rise in PEEP of three or more, or FiO2 of 20% or more, then that's a VAC. And if you have temperature or leukocyte count, then that's an IVAC. Um, and if there is an antibiotic that has uh, been started for, uh, that's been used for four days, then that's an IVAC. And however, that has to be within 48 hours before or after onset of the BAE documentation, um, but cannot be during the first two days of mechanical ventilation. And then finally, uh, possible uh, VAPs or probable VAPs, depending on sputum or BAL neutrophils, all right? Uh, previously, condition in the criteria used to be purulence. However, now you don't have to have purulence. You just need neutrophils of 25%, uh, uh, 25 neutrophils per low power field to determine whether you want to call something as purulent or not, all right? And then if you don't have a, a positive culture, then it's possible. If you have a culture, then it's probable. So uh, 2015, there is an update uh, in the terminologies and it's called IVAC plus. So all competents beyond IVACs are put into a single umbrella called as IVAC plus, which includes IVAC, P, V, A, P's, both possible and probable. All right, and some of the important things to remember here is certain organisms uh, are excluded uh, when you uh, look at calling uh, uh, a pathogen as contributing to a possible VAP. Uh, examples, we've had many cases of uh, enterococcus found in these sputum samples or trach samples, um, but those are considered aspiration or uh, oral origin. Uh, so some of those examples are mentioned here. And along with that, if you have one other criteria, then that will help you to define that as a possible ventilator associated pneumonia, number one. Criterion one is endotracheal aspirate or BAL, lung tissue, or some of the specimens and the individual values of the colony units are given here, 10 power five, 10 power four, and so on. Purulent secretions defined as, as I mentioned, greater than or equal to 25 neutrophils uh, power field and organism identified. And lastly, if you have other sources such as pleural fluid, abscess, legionella, and viral 
assays. Okay, finally, diagnostic criteria. There are so many different um, institutes that are given the criteria. However, we're using the CDC new definition, and I'll just uh, talk to you about that. High temperature, low temperature, high white count, low white count. Low PF ratio is not uh, a, a, a necessity, but we assume that you know the physician or the RT is increasing their vent settings because PF ratio is dropping. Gram stain neutrophils, new antibiotic has been started. Okay, these are all the diagnostic criteria. And ACCP other criteria are given here. Take up points. Take active effort to detect at-risk patients for increasing PEEP and FIO2 needs. Encourage only RTs, okay, to manipulate ventilators with immediate documentation and after discussion with MDs. And a very important point here, as I said, is it does not matter if you go up on your PEEP or FIO2 for so many hours during the day, but by the end of the day, if you are able to document at least one hour of the PEEP or FIO2 and FIO2 to a lowest possible value, which is not more than 20% or three of PEEP, then you are still safe. So if somebody goes from five um, to eight or nine on day three, and if you can somehow get it back down to seven of PEEP, then you're still safe. You don't have a back. All right. Start moderate to high on your PEEP and FIO2 and then slowly, slowly go down. Taper slowly. Don't have to rush. Um, and a very uh, simple <coughs> trick is consider daily trivial changes on your PEEP and FIO2 to avoid having a steady baseline. That's a pretty you know, easy trick. Um, avoid drastic changes between prone and supine positions also. <clears throat> if you're uh, APRV, which is bivent modes, then only the FIO2 counts. You cannot correlate the PEEP uh, on PRVC and APRV modes. So only the FIO2 is taken into account if your patient goes on APRV for a brief moment <clears throat> for a few hours or a few days, okay? Well, that is it. Uh, please feel free to comment or ask questions. And uh, thank you uh, for this wonderful opportunity.